All right, now last time we talked about one of the most important questions in philosophy, the nature of causation. And again, if this were a, a course um, on, let's say, metaphysics or uh, epistemology, I would spend more time on causation, but I want you to see its importance for the philosophy of mind. Now, the a decisive author in, uh, ca on causation is David Hume, and I think his influence has been disastrous. Uh, Hume left us with three propositions uh, that most contemporary philosophers believe. I'll add a fourth that's just as false as the other three, but anyway, here they go. Uh, proposition number one is we have no experience of causation. We experience events, and we experience <clears throat> priority, contiguity, and constant conjunction of events. That is, <clears throat> we occur one of, we uh, experience one event happening followed by another event, and then uh, we also observe that events of the same type are followed by events of the same type, but you never can perceive a causal link between events. Uh, there is no such thing as a causal connection. And to put it in very strong terms, there really is no such thing as causation. That's an illusion. It's an illusion uh, in the mind uh, that there is something in addition to the sequence of events and their resemblance relation. <clears throat> and I think most contemporary philosophers believe that. They believe, as I, uh, in the, in, I looked at intentionality, uh, my, my book on the subject uh, this morning, and I note I quote a passage from von Wright, a very famous and very good philosopher, and he says, causation is not something in nature. In nature, there are only regularities. That's Hume's great message. But now that leaves us with a question, well, what makes causal statements true? I mean, it isn't just my opinion. Uh, that smoking causes cancer or that uh, HIV uh, virus causes AIDS symptoms. It's, it's in a matter of scientific fact. And the answer is, though there isn't causation in the real world, there is something else, uh, namely what Hume called constant conjunction and what nowadays we would call laws of science. So every causal relation has to instantiate some universal law and that's what makes it true. You see, you want to know in philosophy, well, what corresponds to your claim? What fact makes it the case? And most of the difficult philosophical questions are about that. In ethics, the question is, well, what fact makes it the case that I ought to do something? What fact makes it the case that I ought to be moral? I, you, can, you can state the fact that corresponds to the claim that Bill took the money, but what fact corresponds to the claim that Bill did something wrong? Now, that's the central question in ethics. I, and in epistemology, what fact corresponds to the claim that I know something? I, and in here, in this discussion of causation, the question is, what fact corresponds to the claim that something caused something else? And Hume's answer is, it's not because there's a relation of causation. There is no such relation. I, and... <clears throat> What the fact that corresponds to the claim is a universal regularity, which we now call a scientific law. And then the third point is uh, Hume is supposed to have discovered really uh, there's, no, uh, there's no logical relation involved in causation. Causal relations have to be distinguished from logical relations. If I say <clears throat> that uh, all triangles have three sides, then there's a logical relation between being a triangle and being three sides, because the concept of triangle implies the concept of three-sidedness. It's part of the definition. But if I say <clears throat> that uh, AIDS, uh, HIV virus causes AIDS symptoms, there's no logical relation there. It's just a, a, a correlation in nature. Now, there's a fourth proposition that I think is implicit in Hume, and I think, again, most contemporary philosophers accept it, and that is <clears throat> that uh, causation is always a relation between events. First, there's one event, and then there's another event, and they stand in a causal relation. Uh, now, I think all of these propositions are false. Uh, one, two, and four are screamingly false. Uh, but three is, uh, uh, three is more interestingly false, and I'll come to that. So let's go through them in order. Now, Hume's second great discovery, after he had exploded the notion of causation, was the problem of induction, that there, we have no rational ground for believing that the future will resemble uh, the past 
or that observed, unobserved instances will resemble observed instances. I'll get that uh, to that in a moment, but what I'm going to do in the first part of this lecture is talk about causation. Now, first of all, it seems to me not only uh, is it the case <clears throat> that we can perceive a causal relation, we pretty much perceive causal relations throughout our waking life. Uh, watch. I experience myself causing this hat to go up. It isn't that I have observed a constant conjunction between some kind of events, a mental event in my head, and an arm movement carrying a hat. I make the damn thing happen. It's part of the content of my perceptual experience. That I, as part of the content of my uh, experience of acting, that this experience of acting is one of causing the hat to go up. That's what I'm trying to do. The whole notion of intention, and in particularly in intention in action, is a causal notion. The experience of acting is the experience of trying, and I experience trying frequently actually making things happen. I don't always succeed, but typically, <clears throat> with things like raising my hat or scratching my head, the experience of trying succeeds. So the causal uh, connection is part of the very experience itself. Now, what goes for experience also goes <clears throat> for perception. I'm walking along the street, and some guy shoves me. Uh, let's say he, uh, it needn't be a, 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 an occasion for a fist fight. He just bumps into me and knocks me off the sidewalk into the gutter. Now, in that case, I don't observe a constant con uh, conjunction between being pushed and moving, I rather experience the guys actually pushing me, causing the move. This is a case where I perceive the causal connection <clears throat> as part of my, I have to stop and take a drink of water um, to clear my throat. <clears> throat. Oh, well, that was clever. I didn't bring my, well, we just struggle on. I didn't bring my thermos. All right, so <clears throat> in both perception and action, we actually experience the causal relation as part of the content of the experience itself. Elizabeth Anscombe gave a good example of this. I'm sitting at a desk working on philosophy, and a car outside my window backfires, and I jump. Now, do I observe a causal, a, a, a constant conjunction between backfiring and me jumping? No, I just experience the jump causing me to move the very first time it happens. I know this is what caused me uh, to move, is that I actually had a, <clears throat> I actually had the experience of the noise causing a, uh, a reaction, causing a reflex action in me. So the experience of causation is absolutely pervasive. Now what about the role of causal laws? Uh, okay, I want everybody to see this. I have said Hume is wrong about necessary connection. We perceive, we experience the causal relation whenever we consciously perceive or act. Now, somebody might say, yeah, but it could be an illusion. It could be a hallucination. Yeah, but that's true of any experience. That is, if I tell people I get the notion of red by looking at objects that are this color, somebody could say, yeah, but it could be a hallucination. Of course, what you experience is not is not self-guaranteeing. You experience seeming causes. You have the experience of yourself seeming to raise your arm, and you have the experience of this seeming to be red. But the point is that the experience itself contains the existence of the connection as part of its conditions of satisfaction. Causation is part of the content of conscious experiences, both in perception and action. And it's not an objection to say, you might be mistaken. You might be mistaken about any experience. OK, but now then, that leads us with a question. Well, what about causation where no experience is involved? I mean, we do say things like, uh, this movement of this planet caused uh, this behavior in this other planet. We have. Uh, lots of causal relations where there's no, no possibility of any human experience. Well, it seems to me clear <clears throat> that once you get the notion of causation, once the child gets the no notion of causation from its primitive experiences, it's very easy to extend that notion across things that are not experiences, indeed not even humans, uh, not, needn't involve any human intentionality at all. 
So we can now, ex once we've got the notion of causation, once we've got the notion of one thing making something else happen, that's the primitive notion of causation, is the notion of making things happen. Once you've got that, then it's easy to extend it both to other people. Other people act causally. But furthermore, it's easy to extend it beyond the range of human intentionality. And you see causal relations between astronomical objects or causal relations uh, uh, between all sorts of phenomena uh, uh, on Earth, such as the, uh, the tsunami in Japan being caused by an earthquake. You know, this yeah, is what made that happen. And that relation is the same as the relation whereby this experience makes this happen. It makes the hat go up. I, there are some important psychological researches on this. Uh, Piaget, um, <clears throat> I, I, a, a, a child a psychologist, that is, he, he did important work on developmental psychology, investigates uh, uh, the child's concept of causation and how the child acquires the concept of causation. And he notices that ch children very early on acquire the notion of something making something else happen. Uh, furthermore, they get the idea that this is transitive, that if A makes B happen and B makes C happen, then you can make C happen by making A happen. Uh, that's what uh, Piaget calls transitivity, and that occurs very early on uh, in, the, in child development. And there are some wonderful experiments that illustrate this. My favorite is this. Uh, this isn't from Piaget, it's from later work. Uh, you have a kid in the crib, and you give the kid a mobile. Uh, there's a mobile hangover, and the kid has a lot of fun with his hands and feet banging at the mobile. Then you do a mean trick. You substitute a perfect laser simulation of the mobile. So there's no real mobile there, but it looks exactly the same. So the kid starts cheerfully banging away. Nothing happens. You get what the kid could talk. He would say, the conditions of satisfaction of my experience of acting are not being satisfied. Uh, what he says is, wah. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's the same basic idea. He's got the, he has the experience of causation. And the evidence, in this case, what's interesting to me is it's being frustrated. The child is trying to move the mobile. The perceptual experience is, is just right, but it's not, uh, it, the experience isn't being satisfied. Another guy besides Piaget <coughs> uh, was Michotte. And Michotte did a lot of experiences, a lot of experiments on results. This is Piaget and this is Michotte. And uh, Michotte I, I, <coughs> I examined a lot of people uh, who were, report some event that they see on a movie screen. And they report, I saw this cause that to happen. Now, of course, <clears throat> what they see is only a seeming cause. That is, they don't actually, uh, it's not a case that they can establish epistemically that there really was a causal relation. But the fact is that we do experience the world as a set of causal phenomena. It is, and, and I think there is a basis for that. Uh, there is an epistemically sound basis for that in that in our own case, we experience ourselves making things happen and we experience uh, things happening that make things happen to us. The first of those is called action, and the second is called perception. Piaget is one of my favorites because he wrote so many books. It's true, many of them are very badly written, but he did write the damn things. And my favorite Piaget story is he was giving a lecture in Massachusetts, and they noticed in the question period that whenever he was asked a question, he would write and write and write, and then he would answer the question. And they thought, well, man, that guy's really serious. He really writes down the question and thinks about it. Uh, later on, they discovered he was paying almost no attention to the question. He was working on his next book. Uh, <laughs> now, I'd love to be able to do that. Have a question period here, and all of you ask your brilliant questions, and I'm busy working on my next book. And I say, I get up and give you a casual answer to the question, and then go back to work on my book. Uh, but I can't do that, but Piaget did that. Now, I have to say, that's one of the reasons he wrote such bad French. He wrote, uh, the, it's, uh, the prose is terrible, but he did do great work all the same. Okay, so I think it's just wrong to say you can't have the experience of causation. You can have it. In fact, you have it most of the time. 
uh, most of your waking life is spent either perceiving or acting, and both of those uh, are experiences of causation. Secondly, you can then be justified in extending uh, the notion of causation beyond your experiences because the same relation that you experience when you make something happen is a relationship you can observe when you watch other people making things happen or when you watch one event in the world causing another event to happen. Now it's not surprising that uh, primitive people uh, who are in a pre-scientific era tend to think that all causation is intentional causation. Jennifer, to the rescue, thank you very much. Uh, I think why don't we all just stop and have a, have a drink now. I'll let you haul out your hip flasks and whatever you're drinking. I'm going to drink some of this. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm sorry we couldn't provide this for everybody here. Uh, but <clears throat> in any case, let's go then. Uh, well, I, was, I started to say something important, and that is this. The primitive experience of causation is intentional causation. There's some purpose involved, uh, some intentional content involved. And that's why, in a pre-scientific era, people see the world in intentionalistic notions. Uh, they think, uh, when there's a terrible storm, the gods are angry at us. The gods are taking it out on us. The gods are punishing us for something. It's intentionalistic. It takes a lot of sophistication to see the world as a matter of causation which involves no mental content at all where you get rid of uh, the intentional uh, content and just see causal relation as a natural relation among events and states of affairs in the world. Okay, so that's, I'm going, to, going through this rather <clears throat> rapidly because it's all in the assigned reading and I'm sure you all read it very carefully. Proposition number one in Hume uh, that all, uh, I, I, that you never observe, never experience causation is wrong. Uh, Hume was looking in the wrong place. He thought, well, I observe that happen and that happen, but I don't observe any relation. Yes, but when you go out and you make something happen, or when something makes happen, something happen to you, then you do experience the causal relation. Now notice, I don't say you observe it, I'm, or if I did, I was speaking loosely, because you don't stand back and observe uh, your uh, uh, intention and action making your arm go up. Rather, it's part of the content of the very experience that you have, and that, I think, is what we... Uh, what uh, uh, Michaud and <clears throat> Piaget uh, tend to substantiate. Okay, now, that, now let's go to causal laws. Is it the case that every singular causal relation, whenever you say A cause B, there must be some description of A and a description of B such that under those descriptions there's a universal law according to which A caused B? Uh, and I think that's not right either. There are indeed regularities in the world, but many of the events that we want to explain causally are the wrong size to be uh, referred to by causal laws. Uh, there used to be a whole lot of debates about the causes of the First World War. Now notice, we assume the First World War must have had causes. There are explanations. You won't, if you're doing a PhD in this university on the causes of the First World War, and you, and you figure out, well, it's just one of those damn things that happened, didn't have any causes, no, you won't get your PhD. You have to, uh, we have to presuppose, Kant was right about this, that there is some causal explanation for whatever occurs. But it would be absurd to suppose that there's some description of the First World War and some description of the causes such that there is a universal law that events of the first type are always followed by events of the second type. Why, why not? Well, roughly speaking, the laws in science that we're actually happy with, uh, laws like uh, uh, <clears throat> the force equals mass times acceleration, or even in economics, Gresham's law, uh, bad money drives out good money, uh, those are the wrong size for massive historical events like the First World War. You might say, yeah, but surely it has to instantiate some causes, uh, some causal laws at the molecular level. I mean, during the First World War, a lot of molecules moved. That's if, it, if this is the causes up here, and this is the war here, 
uh, then indeed there will be a whole lot of little things going on down here at the level of molecular structure. But the laws that pick out these events don't pick out any event of the size of the First World War. It's just the wrong size to be a part of the law, uh, uh, to be referred to by a law of physics. So the universe is indeed <coughs> describable by universal regularities, causal laws. But the interest that we have in the causes of something and the, and the possibility of describing diverse phenomena under the category of a law need not match. And indeed, they don't match. If you want to describe, the, if you want to give a causal explanation of the victory of uh, the Democrats in the last presidential election, the sorts of things that you will pick out as causes uh, there, there was a massive unemployment, the Bush uh, economic policies didn't seem to be working. Those are not the kind of things that would be referred to uh, by the laws of physics. And it isn't a gift. Well, they've got to have some other description to refer to them. No, the size of the events are the wrong size. Now, I think the notion of a, of a law of science is very interesting and very problematical. And I don't know any satisfactory philosophical account. It's fairly recent. I don't think the Greeks had anything like our notion of the laws of physics. I'm too ignorant about the details of Greek philosophy to say that with confidence. But those of you who can read Aristotle in Greek ought to read it carefully. I think our notion of a scientific law really came in in the 17th century. And it is a, it is a very powerful notion. But I, uh, I'm curious to know how far you can go with it. Uh, there's a very interesting book by Nancy Cartwright called How the Laws of Physics Lie. Uh, now, Nancy, I, I, I think she's terrific, but she doesn't write very clearly. So you have to struggle with this book. That's Cartwright. Uh, and in that book, uh, she argues that it's just wrong to think that everything is describable uh, by the laws of physics. There aren't enough laws to go around. We don't have enough laws uh, to cover all this phenomena, uh, all these phenomena. And that's an interesting idea, and I'm sorry the book didn't get more attention. But partly it, ha it didn't get much, as much attention as it should have gotten because, it's, as I said, it's difficult to read. Uh, she is an amazing lecturer. She gave lectures here, and it, uh, she gave a, a Townsend lecture, and a, a lot of the sentences in the lecture were striking sentences, but they didn't, I couldn't get a theory that hung together. One of my favorites was she said, causation is recalcitrant. Yeah, okay, tell us more. But anyway, I remember that, and I think she's right about that. It's just I'd like to know more about it. OK, so secondly, I think Hume is just wrong that for every single causal relation, uh, they, they have to instantiate a law under some description or other. Why? The size of events that interest us are not the same size as what is picked out <clears throat> by laws at the molecular level, or even laws like the laws of gravity at a gross level. All right. <clears throat> now, logical relations. There is a sense in which there's a logical relation in intentional causation because all intentional causation consists of a cause that represents the effect or in the case of uh, perception, uh, uh, the effect is a representation of the cause. When I raise my arm, my intention in action is that my arm should go up. That's the cause. And the description of the event that it causes is, guess what? My arm goes up. That is, the description is the same uh, for reasons that you know. Namely, intentional contents represent their conditions of satisfaction. So the terminology in which you describe the cause and the terminology in which you describe the effect will be the same. In perception, the direction of fit and the direction of causation are the opposite but the same logical relations remain. If I remember going on a picnic yesterday, then going on a picnic describes the event, uh, the cause, and then the effect, remembering going on a picnic, uses the same vocabulary. So paradoxically, it's a mistake to think, well, you can't use the same vocabulary to describe the cause and the effect, because in the case of intentional causation, 
Either the cause is a representation of the effect, that's the case of intentional action, or the effect is a representation of the cause, that's a case of perception and memory. So I think that's wrong too. Now the fourth one I didn't attack uh, in the book that you read, in intentionality, but I want to attack it now. It's handy when we talk about cause, and I've been doing it, uh, to talk as if causation was always a relation of events. But that really is a mistake. Uh, basically, uh, we, we pick out events when we want causal relations because we want certain things explained. Why was there an earthquake? off of Japan. Why was there a First World War? But causation as a relation is everywhere. I think of gravity. Right now we're all subject to a very powerful causal force, the gravitational attraction of the Earth uh, and our body. And as you know, it is stated by the inverse square law. But gravity doesn't name an event. It names a permanent force, a permanent power uh, that operates on you at all times. Similarly, with a structure of matter, there's a causal explanation of why this hat doesn't just explode. We don't all just uh, dissolve into so much liquid or gas. And the reason is, well, I don't, I don't know the details of the reason, but it has to do with things like weak and strong nuclear forces. And those go on all, all day long. Those are not the names of discrete events. First this event and that happened. So causation is a matter of the permanent structure of the universe and not a matter of just one event being followed by another event. Uh, the whole notion of an event I, I picks out sequences of, of uh, uh, phenomena that occur relative to our interests. We're interested in things like earthquakes and uh, uh, famines uh, and uh, depressions and wars. Uh, but the, the causal relations and the basic structure of the universe, those continue all the time. So the picture I'm giving you is that Hume's account of causation is wrong. It is his most influential view and most philosophers accept it. I do not. I think we experience causation pretty much all the time. I, that there is a type of logical relation, that there aren't enough laws to go around, I, and that the size of the events that are picked out by causal explanation doesn't match the size of events picked out by uh, statements of laws. Why should it? Okay, now that's so much for causation. Now I have to say a word about the problem of induction. Again, it's not uh, essential to the, uh, to, to the philosophy of mind, but for part of your general philosophical education, uh, you should know something about the problem of induction. So I'm leaving causation in the narrow sense, we're going to come back to it when we talk about explanation. Well, let me just say a word about explanation before we get to that. In explaining human behavior, for the most part, we want to know the causes. We want to know the causes of the war, the causes of the, uh, the Democrats' victory in 08 and their subsequent uh, loss in the congressional elections of uh, 2010. Uh, we want to know a cause and effects, and the cause and effects that we, we seek are mostly intentionalistic. We want to know the intentional cause of the uh, Republicans' defeat in 08, and that means we want to know such things as what did the voters believe? What did they desire? How did they think their beliefs and desires could be effective politically? And that means you're looking for intentional causation. So the explanation of human behavior, for the most part, is a matter of intentional causation. Not always. Why not? Well, sometimes you get <clears throat> systematic relations, which are the consequences of intentional causation. Uh, and you, those are, so to speak, systematic fallouts from intentional causation. So in mac microeconomics, you assume uh, that entrepreneurs are trying to make money. They're trying to make as much money as they can. And you assume uh, that consumers are trying to be better off. They're trying to get as much as they can for their money. All of that is intentional causation. Now then, if you spell out the consequences of that, it turns out that the rational entrepreneur 
will sell at this point. Uh, well, this is the standard uh, supply. These are the standard supply and demand curves in any economics textbook. The, the uh, rational entrepreneur will sell where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. But now notice the consumers and the business people don't have to be thinking, I got to sell where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Until they started going to college, businessmen never heard of marginal cost and marginal revenue. And they did a survey in Oxford when I was a kid. They asked the local business people, do you sell where marginal cost equals marginal revenue? And all oh, these guys never heard of it. They said things like, well, we do what dad did. Uh, we put a 20% markup on all the haberdashery items. These are shops in, in Oxford. Oh, OK, 20% markup on haberdashery items. Uh, I, the point is, you don't have to have the concept of marginal cost and marginal revenue. Uh, that's a systematic fallout of the desire to make money uh, and the uh, desire on the part of uh, consumers to get as much as they can for their money. That the supply and demand curves will, cause, will cross at a certain point, and that's the point where the profits will be maximized. Uh, okay, so we're going to get to intentional causation and the ex explanation of human behavior, but now I'm going to say a bit about the problem of induction. So questions about causation. I'm, I'd love to teach a whole course on causation. We don't have time for it, but I do want you to have the, the basic structure that, the, that what most philosophers believe is a version of Hume, and I think it is mistaken. It runs counter to our whole experiences. Yes. No, that's not quite what I'm saying. So let me I, I make it clear. I think I probably wasn't clear. The question is, am I trying to base causation in the world on mental causation? No, that isn't it. Uh, the world doesn't give a damn about us. And there was a, a causal relations in the world long before there were any human beings uh, to have mental causation. The question I am asking is an epistemic question. How can we be justified in making causal claims if, as Hume says, there's no such thing as a causal relation that we could ever experience? And my answer is, there is such a thing as a causal relation. We do experience it, and that's why we can be justified uh, in attributing causal relations to other people and, this is the next step, attributing causal relations uh, to events that have no mental component at all. We are justified in using the notion of causation because it's part of our experience. That's the point I'm making. I'm not saying, well, really, uh, events in the world, uh, astronomical events, are really trying to do something. They're not trying to do anything. Uh, it's just there, there are causal relations, and we can be justified in ascribing causal relations because we experience causation all the time. Now, another mistake that I, I mean, I, another misunderstanding, which I want to block now, is this. I am not offering you a theory about how children get the concept of causation. That's an empirical question for developmental psychologists. For all I know, it may be innate. Maybe the kids are born with a causation, notion of causation already programmed into the brain. What I am now answering is how can we answer Hume's skepticism that says you can never be justified, you can never have any rational ground for attributing cause and effect relations uh, other than just constant conjunction. And I'm saying, no, we experience causation all the time. There's a guy at the very back, you're going to have to shout. Uh, I don't understand why a human can just respond to you by saying, what happens is one experience followed yeah. by another experience. Right, OK. One all right, now let's, I, let's go through it. I have this experience. And I have another experience, my arm going up. But notice, it's not like uh, if, for example, I saw this fall and I saw this fall. I just observed two events because it is part of the experience that it was one of trying. What described the experience to me, it is an experience of intentionally trying to raise my arm. And that notion of trying is a causal notion. And now, let me put it in the jargon that you're familiar with. The notion of causation figures in the conditions of satisfaction. 
It isn't something that lies outside the experience. It's part of the very experience itself that is the experience of causing something to happen. Even if I'm mistaken, even if it was caused by something else, all the same, that was the character of the experience. The experience of causation was built into the experience in the same way that the experience of red is built into this experience. Even if I'm mistaken, it doesn't matter because what we're talking about is the ground, the justification for having the concept at all. And it also applies to perception. I'm glad, grateful for the question because it's, that's the essential point that I'm trying to get across. When you are actually engaged in your life in consciously perceiving and acting, you do not observe neutrally a series of events happening to something. What you do is experience yourself trying to do things, experience yourself making things happen, and you experience other things making things happen to you. The first is called action, and the second is called perception. OK, you had your hand up. Yeah. It relieves the skepticism about causation, but only it seems, at least in part, in virtue of some epistemic access you have to the experience of yeah. causation. I don't see how that can be extended necessarily to include other, what we would call causation, but where we have no experience. Well, you're not part of the experience. Yeah. Well, I discussed that in the chapter on causation, and have a look and see if you think my answer is any good. Uh, but I think you're right that that's weaker. Uh, than the claim I make about the actual experience. I mean, I don't think anybody can, can accurately describe this experience without uh, using a causal vocabulary. But now the question is, how can I then be justified in extending the notion of causation beyond my experiences? When I say, uh, well, uh, the reason for the elliptical orbit of the planets is that the force of gravity to continues to operate in uh, certain ways, and, and, and it comes in conflict with Newton's first law, so you get an elliptical orbit. I mean, there's a long, complicated story to be told. I, I think I can make a case for saying, well, look, the relation of one thing making something else happen, of a force operating, is the same notion that works with astronomical objects and with human intentionality. And if you say to me, well, but all the same, I, there are other hypotheses that would account for it. It's not conclusive. I think that's right. But this is generally the case I, in any explanation. There are always an infinite number of hypotheses that will account for any given data. But the question is, am I justified in saying that the same relation exists between planets as exists between me and the arm when I'm I, I trying to make something happen. And I claim, yes, I am justified, because the notion of something making something happen is common to both cases. In one case, I experience it. In the second case, I observe it. And I can observe a relationship occurring in nature, which is the same relationship, the relation of causation, the primitive notion of causation, the notion of one thing making something else happen. I can experience that when I make something else happen. I can observe it when uh, something in nature makes something else happen. When you see the, uh, uh, that the earthquake causes uh, the, uh, the uh, tsunami. But however, I, I think you're right. It's not conclusive. But that's generally the case with hypotheses. It, the, the hypothesis accounts for the data, but it's not conclusive in the sense that only that hypothesis will account for that data. There are all kinds of other hypotheses. Have another try. Is there any sense taking on board the fact that this experience, there is causation in this experience, um, one is still skeptical about causation in observation. Is there any sense in which that's analogous to um, like solipsism where um, yeah. I, just, I, I experience myself, but I'm skeptical, yeah, about, skeptical about other people? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it. Uh, let me just formulate it uh, for other people. I, the, the, the point of the question is this, that it, I, I have said, look, once you experience causation, you can be justified in extending the notion beyond your experiences. Uh, and his question was, well, is skepticism about that like solipsism, where the, uh, the, solip, uh, the, skeptic, the, the solipsistic skeptic says, I'm not justified in it, uh, thinking that there are any experiences in the world except my own experiences. And offhand, it does look like a, uh, a special case. It looks like a special case of solipsism. You had your hand up. Yeah. yeah. Back to the, talk about World War I. Yeah. It say it's between like 1914 and 1918. Yeah. Now, there's events that you know, lead up to this. Right. And there's repercussions afterwards. Yes. 
But how do we distinguish like when one event really begins, one ends? It seems Indeed, it's like a matter of definition. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, they, uh, they, uh, they, let me just repeat the question for for people. Uh, I have said, look, there's World War One. And prior to that, there are these events that lead up to World War I. But what is the justification for putting the slice uh, at this point, saying this was when World War I began and this is when World War I ended? Well, you can kind of do it legalistically speaking, talking about declarations of war and stuff like that. But um, I, it looks like it's a matter of definitions, how we choose to carve up nature. And I think that's right. That's one of the things that's wrong with the conception of causation that says any causal relation must be instantiation of a law because the size of events that we pick out with our uh, common sense intentionalistic vocabulary, wars, depressions, revolutions, uh, 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 philosophical movements, artistic movements, uh, those are not the things that, are, uh, that fit uh, the size of events picked out, let's say, by the laws of molecular physics. And you know, there's a deep point you're making, and I want to emphasize it, and that's this. The world divides up the way we divide it. I've given you this example before, but I'll give it again. Uh, <clears throat> we have a notion that fits this thing here. We have a word for that. And we have another word for this thing here. But that's up to us. We could easily imagine a culture that has a word for this thing, where it's this object that I just made a, uh, a line around, and we'll have a name for an object like that. That is called a glug, OK? And we'll suppose there's a culture where glugs are of enormous importance. Uh, they are religious objects of religious veneration. In fact, what I drew for you was only a simulated glug. Real, honest to John, sacred glugs have to be constructed only by sacred virgins working under holy water. They have to be completely, I won't tell you the whole story, they have to be completely submerged. Uh, and now, furthermore, if you destroy a glug, as I just destroyed this pseudo glug, this simulated glug, death penalty. You get the death penalty for glug destruction, glugicide is a, is a crime like no other. Now that's not our culture. You think there's nothing in our culture as crazy as that? Well, look around. Uh, I think there are lots of things in our culture that are just as crazy as that. The point I'm making now is the world divides up the way we divide it. And the interest that we have in dividing uh, the world <clears throat> I need not and indeed does not match physics, atomic physics. Why should it? One of the dumbest arguments for eliminating materialism was you don't get a smooth reduction of folk psychological notions like belief to neurobiological notions. There's no type, as you know by now, no type-type correlation between beliefs and brain structures. Therefore, the argument goes, beliefs don't exist. That argument is so incredibly feeble that, you, that only really advanced professional philosophers could believe it. Uh, because if that argument were right, we'll think of the following. I, I happen to be a skier. Look at the transformation of skis over the past hundred years. They went from being wood to now extremely complex fiberglass uh, 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 Kevlar sandwiches. Uh, okay, so there's no smooth reduction of the notion of skis uh, to physics, because the physical structure of skis is totally different from what it used to be. Are we going to say skis don't exist? Well, you'd have to say on that ground, you'd have to say cars don't exist, split-level ranch houses don't exist, uh, and uh, uh, fraternity parties don't exist, because the chemical structure has altered uh, over uh, the years. Uh, it's just such a bad art. I don't know how I got off onto this. But anyway, uh, the point I want to make now is it's a very uh, a deep point that the way that we have of describing the world, the way we split up the world into events and objects, uh, is arbitrary. It's up to us what we're interested in. So if somebody asks me, well, what exactly uh, was the cause of the modernist movement in literature? Very important movement. Uh, but I couldn't date when it began uh, and when it ended. In fact, I'm not sure it has uh, ended. But there's clearly a difference uh, between uh, the way that uh, 
uh, Faulkner, Hemingway, Joyce, uh, Kafka, Proust, and Fitzgerald wrote, uh, and the way that uh, 19th century novelists wrote. You read Flaubert and Balzac, uh, and it is uh, just not like, uh, well, uh, Celine. I uh, to, uh, to take a minor French uh, novelist, but it's certainly not like uh, Hemingway or, or uh, uh, Faulkner. Now, clearly there was a modernist movement, and clearly it has a causal explanation, but there's no precise moment when modernism began, and I'm not sure it has ever ended. There are people running around the woods who call themselves postmodernists, but I'm not sure what they, uh, what they think postmodernism is. Uh, the point, however, is we need causal explanations for things that are not well defined in physics. Why should they be? Physics is one area of human investigation, but that doesn't mean that the explanations that we give for everything have to match the kind of explanations we give in physics. On to the problem of induction. Uh, is it a good time to, do, to take attendance? I mean, is everybody who's going to come here here? I feel like saying, those of you who aren't here, raise your hands. Um, uh, but everybody, write your name and your TA on a sheet of paper just so I know who showed up, and that way I can flunk all the people who don't show up. If we divide up these events arbitrarily, do we say then that in reality there is no separate events, but rather one continuous happening? Yeah, well, I, I, okay, let me answer that. That's a good question. Yeah. If you're trying to find Jennifer, she's there. Okay, uh, let's go back to work. Um, I, 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 during our brief intermission, a guy asked me I, if we should think the world is not consisting of events but really as one great big event. Well, there's always this urge in philosophy to think that we ought to have some totalizing uh, concept. But I think the notion of an event is useful. We need to be able you know, to identify uh, discrete patterns in uh, sequences. So uh, the use of a notion like a war or a revolution or a love affair or an artistic movement, those are useful notions. And those cite events and I don't know how we would cope with reality if we didn't have notions of objects like glugs or rostrums or tables, and if we didn't have notions of events like wars and elections and revolutions. Language has to serve purposes. It has to serve the purpose of organizing human experiences and enabling human beings to communicate. Now, later on, if we have time, I'll explain to you how we also use language to create human civilization. We create money and property and government, marriage, cocktail parties, universities, uh, and, and uh, philosophy courses, all by applying language, all by uh, imposing certain linguistic categories. Okay, I'm now going to give you a brief, like, five-minute uh, solution to the problem of induction. <clears throat> Hume had two great problems. One was necessary connection and causation, and I have attacked uh, that. And I hope, I don't, this is not a promise, but on the exam you, have a, you ought to have a chance uh, to attack my views or say what you think about these things. I don't promise you that there'll be a question on causation, but it makes a good exam question. Uh, but the second uh, problem that Hume had, and indeed I think a lot of people suppose this is Hume's most important contra co contribution, was the problem of induction. How can it be the case that I'm justified in believing that the sun will rise tomorrow when I've never observed the sun rising tomorrow. All the observations that I've made are about the past. And indeed, if I say, well, there's the law of gravity that explains it, but the law of gravity is itself based on past observations. Not just gravity alone, but the, 
uh, the circular orbit, uh, uh, the circular rotation of the Earth on its axis relative to the sun, which gives us the impression that the, uh, that the sun rises and sets. I, uh, that all of that is based on observations, but those observations are about the past. Okay, now there's a standard textbook argument <clears throat> answer to Hume, and it's pretty good. I'll, I'll give it to you now. I mean, uh, there, uh, it leaves out a whole lot of deep questions, but here's how it goes. When Hume says the induction is not justified, what he's ask, you have to ask yourself, by what standards? And it turns out that what he is insisting on are deductive standards. He is insisting that in the argument, all men are mortal. Uh, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is uh, mortal. You get a logical entailment relation between the premises and the conclusion. But in the case where you have a hypothesis that's tested by evidence, and the evidence supports the hypothesis, you don't get a logical entailment. It doesn't follow from the evidence that the hypothesis is true, but why should it? Uh, induction is not deduction. What Hume did was simply show that inductive arguments are not valid by deductive standards, but that's just an, in a, it's just an inadequate and inappropriate demand to suppose that inductive arguments ought to be valid by deductive standards. Are inductive arguments valid? Some are and some aren't, just like deductive arguments. But the standards by which they are valid are not deductive standards. It's as if uh, I, uh, somebody said, your mo motorcycle is no good because it doesn't get good marks in a dog show. Well, it's not trying to be a dog. It's inappropriate. It's just ridiculous to suppose the motorcycle ought to um, um, meet the standards for a dog show. Similarly, it is equally ridiculous to suppose uh, that inductive arguments ought to meet deductive standards. So the standard argument goes that Hume has just placed uh, incorrect and inappropriate criteria for assessing inductive arguments. Now, I think that uh, textbook account is OK as far as it goes, but there's a bit more to be said. Uh, it's misleading to think that there are really two, these two kinds of arguments, so-called inductive and uh, deductive. And the fact that the words almost rhyme, the fact that they sound alike, makes it look as if uh, they're somehow in the same line of business, but they are not. Deduction is a matter of working out the logical consequences, typically, of a set of premises. Induction is probably a misleading expression uh, that, is, uh, that describes how we find out about how the world works by doing investigations. And uh, on one standard view, uh, the way we do it is not by going and assimilating a lot of uh, evidence and then seeing uh, and then making a generalization. Sometimes we do that, but that's rare. What typically happens, according to this view, is you form a hypothesis and then you test it. So that you have the hypothesis plus the test in the experience, and then you see if the test confirms or refutes the hypothesis. If it refutes the hypothesis, you say the hypothesis is false. If it confirms the hypothesis, you don't say the hypothesis is necessarily true. You just try to get more confirmation. You say that is at least confirmed uh, by uh, the evidence so far, by the, uh, the tests. So the way that it works is not by getting a bunch of examples and then generalizing, but by getting a hypothesis and then deducing from the hypothesis together with the experimental situation. So you have the hypothesis plus situation, and then you deduce a test. So you have the hypothesis that bodies attract according to the inverse square law, and you have, an in, uh, you have a particular experimental uh, situation. And then that, those, if you put those together, they will predict that the object will fall toward the center of the Earth at a certain velocity. And what you do is you make a, hypo you make a prediction by deducing the prediction from the hypothesis together with your experimental apparatus. And then you test the, the hypothesis by seeing if the prediction comes true. If it comes true, 
you say the hypothesis is to that extent confirmed. If it doesn't come true, you say the hypothesis has been falsified. So it isn't by induction, but by a method that is sometimes called the hypothetical deductive method. Deduction and induction are not opposed to each other. Rather, you use, it, you use deduction to work out the consequences of your hypotheses. Uh, there's a lot of hassles about who um, uh, first thought of this. Uh, and Popper claims that he thought of it. And a lot of people will say that Peter Hempel, Carl Gustav Hempel, thought of it. I, I thought Hempel was a nicer guy than Popper. So my, uh, my vote is, goes for Hempel, but I'm not sure that that's based on historical evidence. Doesn't matter. It's a pretty good account. Uh, it's a better account of how uh, testing works in the physical sciences uh, than, for example, the idea that you just go out and get a bunch of evidence. What the hell makes it evidence? You have a hypothesis you want to test, and then you test it by, my, by making deductions. Now, that's physics. I have a friend who's a social psychologist, and he tells me in social psychology, we can never do that. In social psychology, we're just kind of thrashing around and trying to get different ideas, and somebody comes up with the idea. Well, everybody's trying to reduce dissonance. We don't know what the hell dissonance is, but we think people are trying to reduce it. So we go out and do a lot of experiments to see if they reduce dissonance. So I don't want to give you a, an, a, an over a simplified version, but clearly this seems to me a better conception of how investigation proceeds than the conception that says, well, it's a matter of getting evidence and forming a hypothesis. You don't even know what to look for until you got a hypothesis. If I say, look around the room and find evidence, well, evidence for what? I have to know what I'm looking evidence for before I can say that such and such is evidence or such and such is not evidence. OK, now I'm going to go to the next question. And I, I didn't spend much time on induction. You'll have a chance to ask questions about it. But most of this lecture was about causation, intentional causation, uh, and uh, the problem of induction. And uh, now I want to go uh, to the next question, which is the nature of psychological explanation, and in particular, the nature of, and in general, rather, I should say, the nature of explanation in the social sciences. Now, let me put that question in a somewhat more polemical vein. Uh, if somebody does the intellectual history of the past 100 years or so, there's a very interesting asymmetry. And that is <clears throat> the natural sciences uh, continue to make enormous progress. Uh, in fact, it's very hard to keep up even uh, with the part of the natural sciences I'm most interested in, neurobiology. Uh, we just know a whole lot more. I was on the president's decade of the brain in the 1990s. Uh, and of course, we didn't solve the problem of the brain. Uh, but we just know an awful lot more about the brain uh, than we used to know. When I first got interested in the brain, we knew of about five neurotransmitters. Now, my god, I don't know how many there are, 50, I suppose, uh, uh, neurotransmitters. And we're still discovering more. Uh, OK, so we continue to make lots of progress in the natural sciences. Now, I think we make progress in the social sciences, but it's nothing like that. And that raises a question. Well, what is the relation between the natural sciences and the social sciences? And in particular, what are we looking for when we seek to explain human behavior? When we want to explain wars and revolutions and depressions and uh, recessions and uh, uh, social transformations and, and uh, the kind of thing that's going on now in, in uh, uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Now, it looks like there are two types of explanations. Uh, there's the level of intentionality where we seek to explain why Obama won the election by citing such things as the fact that the economy uh, was not in good shape uh, at the uh, time of the presidential election. It wasn't in good shape I, 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 two years later at the time of the congressional election. And Obama, who benefited from that in 2008, suffered from that in 2010. Now, in the case of human beings, there's also a level of neurophysiology below the level of the intentionality. And we want to know what sorts of explanations can we give of human behavior. 
Well, we can say things like that guy voted for Obama because he thought Obama would be better for the economy. That's an intentionalistic explanation. And this level is sometimes, as you know, called folk psychology. That's usually by people who want to sneer at it. But in fact, it's the explanation that we use for most human behavior, is to cite beliefs and desires and hopes and fears and aspirations. And that works by way of intentional causation. Now, we assume that there's a level of explanation at the level of neurophysiology. It's just we don't know enough about the brain to know how to explain things at that level. So we say things like, she voted for Obama because she thought uh, he would produce a better economic policy. But we don't know how to say things like, she voted for Obama because of a condition in her hypothalamus. Uh, we assume there's got to be something going on in the brain, but we have no idea how to use that. Now, this part down here, this looks like science. This looks like what we're aspiring to, but this doesn't look like science. It looks like sort of common sense. I, and as you know, some people have thought, well, maybe it doesn't really exist. Maybe there is no such a thing as a level of intentionality. Those are called eliminative materialists. Remember them? We talked about them uh, months ago when we were doing the mind-body problem. So we have intentionalistic explanations that work just fine. Uh, we think there must be neurobiological explanations, but we don't know how to make them work. Uh, how do we fit these together? This leaves us with what all intellectuals abhor, a gap. It leaves us with a, a gap in our explanatory apparatus between the level of common sense intentionality and the level of uh, physical, chemical, biological uh, neurophysiology. How do we fill that gap? Now, I'm going to argue uh, that there is no gap, uh, that the, there are many different levels of intentionality and many different levels of neurobiology, and that the intentionality is grounded in the neurobiology. There is no gap uh, between the two which remains to be filled. But much of the history of the 20th century, I, mean, I hope it's changing in the 21st century, but much of the intellectual history was about various attempts to fill the gap. Well, you, what are the gap fillers? Well, you know the most famous one, and it's still not dead, and that is the computational theory, that really what fills the gap between folk psychology and neurobiology are computer programs. What matters is the program. The program is implemented in the brain, but the implementation doesn't matter. Any implementation will do. You know from multiple realizability that the same program can be implemented in an indefinitely large range of different hardwares. And what matters for a science of cognition, for cognitive science, is getting the program right. Uh, now, as you know, I've been attacking this, well, let's see, since 1980. Yeah, that comes to, uh, uh, like a time before any of you were born. I, and I, I think I'm winning that war, but it's a long battle. I think, however, that the computational theory of the mind doesn't have anything like the grip that it did when we founded cognitive science uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s. What is it's being replaced by, and I welcome this, the computational paradigm of human cognition is being replaced by uh, the, the uh, neurobiological paradigm. Computational neuroscience, compu uh, computational cognitive science is being, re being replaced by cognitive neuroscience. And that's a scientific revolution that is happening right now. Uh, if you're a cognitive science major, uh, you will hear much more about the brain than you would have heard if you were a cognitive science major when we first got the major going uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, now, I would like to say, well, people got convinced by my arguments. I, I don't think that so much happened, was they got wonderful uh, research devices. And particularly, they got a great big magnet uh, over there by Tolmets in an ugly building. Uh, but they got the magnetic resonance imaging. Now, what happens? There is a kind of pattern to this. Each new tool for studying the brain is announced 
as the great breakthrough. At last, with PET scans or CAT scans or EKG or whatever it was, we can see how your brain works. And, and the magnet, the magnetic resonance imaging, particularly with a small f, functional magnetic resonance imaging, gives people uh, the sense that there is. So fMRI uh, gives uh, people uh, the sense that now at last we have a scientific tool for connecting this level and this level. And, and I think it's terrific. I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I, I like to make fun of everything, but I think that this is a more promising research uh, project than was the old computational model. I think it's fair to say that computational cognitive science failed. Uh, there are certain areas in which it was uh, useful, but what we're now getting is we're actually discovering a whole lot more about how the brain really works. Okay. However, the computational model was not the only one. There were lots of others. Uh, for a long time, people thought, well, the magic is really games theory. And what we have to see is that most human cognition consists of solving games theoretical problems. I, I don't really know enough about games theory to have an intelligent opinion, but my impression is it's very useful in certain uh, areas. Uh, I, when I was an undergraduate, I happened to share an apartment with one of the early founders of games theory. He was the English, he was actually South African, but he was the English equivalent uh, of a guy named Nash, who really was a nut case. They made a movie about Nash called A Beautiful Mind, and that movie shook me because I lived with the, with the English version of Nash. Robin Farquharson was the English, he was a South African genius who was like Nash. Uh, now, he died tra tragically, yeah, I did Robin. But I knew about Nash uh, before anybody else did because Robin was obsessed about Nash. Nash was always a step ahead of Robin. But Robin did uh, publish some important work uh, before he died. And you can probably find him on Google. His name was Robin. Farquharson. So I suffered from games theory before anybody else had ever heard of it. But I, as a result of that, I resisted learning anything about it. And to this day, I, I can use you know zero-sum games and stuff like that as a metaphor. But I don't really understand it. But I'm pretty convinced that it doesn't provide us with a key to understanding human behavior. It's a useful tool uh, in economics and political analysis. And we don't know how far it's going to go. Now, another gap filler which fascinates me is sociobiology. Sociobiology. And sociobiology was the idea that the secret of understanding human behavior is to see us as sociobiological products that our societies and our individual psychologies are the products of evolutionary pressures. Now, at one level, uh, that can hardly be wrong, because we are the projects, uh, the, the, the uh, products of several million years of uh, uh, biological evolution. But the idea is, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the big honcho in sociobiology was Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, and the idea was we ought to quit doing philosophy and quit doing psychology and these other subjects. And, if, and we come back to them later, but get the sociobiological basis. And the idea was that all human behavior and all human societies are the products of evolutionary pressures. And we will not understand uh, human society and human behavior until we see the sociobiological basis. Uh, now, there is an immediate objection to that uh, that I don't think Wilson ever had an adequate answer to. But here's the objection, and that is, if you want to explain human society, uh, then you have to be able to account for the enormous variations in human society. But there aren't, in that way, enormous variations in our gene pool. Uh, the gene pool, the human uh, uh, genetic resources have not changed, I get this from a physical anthropologist, have not changed in the past 30,000 years. Suppose they're wrong by a factor of 10. Suppose it's uh, only in the past 3,000 years that they've been more or less stable. All the same within those three millennia, think of the different forms of society. 
think of all of the different types of society, ranging from uh, the, uh, the pharaohs uh, uh, through um, uh, communes uh, in, the, in the Sierra Nevada in the 1960, uh, or uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, freeway networks, think, uh, or fascism and communism and, uh, and socialism and various types of organizing society. The problem is that if you're trying to explain human society, you have to recognize that there are enormous variations, enormous variety in human society, but there isn't in that way enormous variety in the gene pool. The gene pool remains, the genetic basis remains relatively constant. And, and what I think Wilson said about this objection was, well, all the same, though there are these surface variations, you will see underlying commonalities in all of these societies, underlying commonalities in the relation of the sexes, for example. Now, even that I'm not so sure about, though I'll give you some examples later. Now, if sociobiology is going to succeed, one of the things it has to do is show us some successes. And Wilson thought uh, there were some successes. Here was he thought was his greatest success. Uh, there is a remarkable fact about all human societies, and that is they all have an incest taboo. It varies from one culture to another. Uh, some cultures, it's OK to marry your first cousin, and other cultures, you can't marry your first cousin. But all societies have a taboo against uh, mother, a son, father, daughter, brother, sister, sexual relations. They all have an incest taboo. Odd exceptions like the pharaohs, uh, where you have to marry your sister, uh, have to do with another force at work, namely noblesse oblige. Nobody else is good enough for you. Only your sister comes from a good enough family for you to marry her. Uh, you can't marry riffraff uh, like the aristocrats down the road. You can only marry somebody who's in your class, and your sister is the only girl in your class. OK, but that's an oddball case. We're not, we're not going to hold that against Wilson. Wilson says all cultures have an incest taboo. Why do they have an incest taboo? And he says, the reason is uh, we know from uh, developmental studies that people are not sexually attracted to people that they grew up with. And here uh, we have solid evidence from the kibbutz, what I call a kibbutz syndrome. Uh, in the kibbutz, in the Israeli kibbutz, in the classic uh, uh, kibbutz, uh, the children are all brought up in a common uh, nursery. I mean, they're, the parents, they see the parents at the end of the day, but basically they're, uh, the children grow up in common. Okay, now what they discover is when the kids uh, get older, they don't want to have sex with the girls they grew up with, or the boys they grew up with. It's that other kibbutz on the other side of the hill. There the girls look better, or the boys look better than the ones I, I grew up with. The ones I grew up with, that's, that's uh, 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 Sally and, and, and Sam and Betty. I don't want anything to do with them. So, uh, uh, so the kibbutz syndrome is supposed to give us solid evidence for the uh, pervasiveness of uh, the uh, incest taboo. And the evidence is this. Growing up together produces a decrease in sexual uh, desire uh, for the people you grew up with. You tend to be more attractive. Uh, I, roughly speaking, familiarity doesn't breed contempt, but it does breed sexual indifference. Uh, and you find other people on the other side of the hill uh, more attractive than the ones you grew up with. OK, now then, this serves, why is that? It serves an evolutionary function. And the evolutionary function is uh, you don't want, for evolutionary purposes, it's a bad idea uh, to have uh, sex with people who share your own genes. And to, to answer that question, you have to ask, well, why do we have biparental reproduction at all? Uh, all the authorities agree biparental reproduction is a tremendous hassle. Uh, and it produces a neurosis, divorce, uh, romantic poetry, and all kinds of other uh, e economically useless phenomena.
phenomena you may have a you may have experienced uh, some of the uh, the, uh, the disadvantages of our predilection for biparental reproduction why don't we reproduce in an economically sensible fashion like the amoeba right the amoeba doesn't go and find a girl a boy amoeba that he likes no the amoeba just walks along the road and then splits just undergoes fission and what wouldn't it be much better if we could do that if i could just have fission just reproduce now it's true there would be various problems whose driver's license is it uh, and uh, who owns the property uh, uh, and who gets the university degree but still it certainly would be much more efficient than biparental reproduction the answer is biparental reproduction mixes the genes and you get evolutionary advantages to not keeping the genes constant okay We've run out of time, and I will tell you the dramatic uh, uh, answer to sociobiology on Tuesday.